Roberts is back here on the Boston Man Show with Paul Mills with the Oral Roberts Golden Eagles. They're 5-5 five and five right now, 2-0 in Summit League play. Coach, how's life, man, out there at Oral Roberts right now? Well, it, you know, I think in a coach's life, it all depends on what happens last. So if you lost in your last time out, you're probably not in a very good mood. And then if you won, uh, you're probably in a better mood. And so – uh, fortunately, the last two times out on the road, we've been able to be on the right side of the scoreboard. And, and so it's good. And, and you're just focused on, hey, how do we get better? And uh, let, let's make sure we go 1-0 and uh, the next time we're out. And depending upon how that game goes, we'll hit the reset button and we'll try to go 1-0 and again. So I think it's just constantly moving it, trying to be uh, one and oh. So today I'm just trying to win today. We need a good practice in order to to prepare for this weekend. Most definitely. And I was going to ask you about that, coach. You know, you guys will play 10 games. You know, my buddy at Siena, Carmen Masarello, has only played like a few games, you know. So how is it, you know, with you guys, man, have been able to play 10 games, being blessed to be able to have, have that many in already and playing some games for money as well and getting raised raise money for the school as well because other schools can't even get games. And, you know, so how is it blessed are you, you, you and your staff are for your players to be able to get in 10 games this COVID year is going to be weird all year long? Yeah, you know, November 25th, uh, the opening date for college basketball when they moved it back, I mean, it wasn't until about a minute before tip-off that I realized, like, wow, this is actually going to happen. And even though that we had made the trip to, to play Missouri, a very good Missouri team, and, and you were just – there's just so many uncertainties that, you know, I just thought, like, right before the tip, something would happen and it would get canceled. And so the, the whole idea of being able to play in the COVID era, as I shared with our guys, uh, what you do realize is it is such a privilege to play. And, and you know, that the opportunity to play, the privilege to play, I do think that we have a very mature team. And because we have a very mature team, they've been able to handle things. Not that teams who uh, had an influx of COVID um, issues aren't mature, but um, our, our, for most of our guys, um, we had a number of COVID issue parents um, in ICU for several of our players. Obviously, what's going on throughout the country, a number of our players, families, uh, members lost jobs. And so I think as all this began to unfold in June and July, you know, we were so conscientious about just let's do the right thing. Uh, and, 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 you know, we could do the right thing and COVID could still impact us but let's try our best to do the right thing because it was so personal um to see family members in icu fortunately we didn't none of our players lost any of their family members but i mean there were days and weeks where it was touch and go um and fortunately family members but they've also seen the the financial devastation up close and so you do realize it's a privilege to play as you're going through a global pandemic and uh we we can't take this stuff for granted Coach, this went to my birthday, which is March 11th, when I was at the Hawks and the Knicks game. I got the text that it's going to suspend it. And the 12th, everything is shut down. So how was it for your staff going back to my birthday in March and saying, going from being on campus, being with you guys, to being at home, going virtual, and trying to keep the grades up at home in that new at home environment and trying to learn. I know, Coach, I couldn't do virtual learning. I, I, I would suck at that, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> how was that for your guys and your staff, man, losing your players for all those months with no contact, send them face-to-face? Face face. Now they'd be, everything would be just Zoom and, and virtual stuff then. Yeah, Mar March 11th was a, a Wednesday, and, and I, I can remember that, you know, as going through it, you, you had your situation. And then, you know, here in Oklahoma City was when Rudy Gobert um, and the Utah Jazz were at Oklahoma City. And it began to go down and you begin to see it. We were actually preparing for postseason. Um, we had a postseason invite. And so we had the guys around. And then by the time Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, I began to meet with the players. And I said, you know what, in all likelihood, we are not going to see y'all again. And we need to send you guys home. Um, you need to take your books. And so I can remember being with several of them on that Sunday and having meetings with them once we realized we were going to have to cancel postseason. And, and I think the, hey, going through it, our guys did a phenomenal job in the spring semester, um, had a, over a 3.3 GPA. But you, you were so conscientious about just everything that's going on. 
And it, and when this began to roll out, nobody knew anything, right? Yep. We didn't know if we touched something, if we got COVID. We, we didn't know if we stood by somebody and they breathed on us. We didn't know how all this played out. And so, I mean, if you remember, nobody could even find toilet paper. Yes. Uh, during, you know, and it, it, it was just a mad rush towards, you know, and, and as we look back now, you know, did it, was it a little, were we way just, over the top, did we did we realize some things? And then you realize, like, man, this is a respiratory disease that impacts a number of people, mm -hmm. but we really have to protect our vulnerable um, people over the ages of 65. And we have to be so conscientious about uh, what happens there. And I think as more information just begin to can't come out, we begin to take the attitude of how do we help our neighbors? Like, you know what, for, for high-level athletes, Yes, um, if you get touched by this, it may be minimal. Um, it may have, may be more than. And so we need to make sure that we get you with the heart doctors. But I, we just really tried to instill in our guys, how can we help our neighbor? And then obviously you had the, the, the influx of, of politics and then George Floyd this summer. And then it really became about, man, how do you help your guys? You know, how can you serve your guys during this time, Most knowing definitely. all of the racial animosity that's going on in a political year? And so I ju we just became so conscientious, and, and I think our players will tell you this, just about, hey, you know what? Our job is to love one another, and love means giving. So we need to give uh, of ourselves. We need to give of our time. Uh, we need to give of our efforts. And, and so I don't think it's been easy by any stretch of the imagination but what I do think it's done is it's stretched um, our players and it stretched our staff as people in order to kind of let's get outside of ourselves and let's find a ways to, uh, to love others uh, through our energy, through our time, through our giving. Let's do those things. And I, I think that's what this, you know, last what's now going nine months um, has really done for our basketball team. And Coach, same here with my staff. I've, I've seen myself since my, my, my party. I had a party on March 14th, Coach. I know I shouldn't have did it, but I had a party on March 14th. That's the last time we was all together and out. But I told them, hey, let's use it here to adapt, overcome, and conquer, and grow as people. Because for me, yeah. Coach, using this radio show, man, I never talked about life life issues where I did with Joe after George Floyd and Martin Arbery, Jacob Blake. I never talk about politics on my show or anything political on my show. But the yeah. moment was like, hey, as a, as a black man living in Atlanta, I, I have to speak on this, you know, and not, not, not sweep it on the rug anymore, you know. So, and the coach, yeah. I'll ask with you, I lost the sponsors because I spoke the truth about what, how life is for me here in Atlanta as a, as a young black male in my 30s. But I feel like it was, it was for the right cause. I was giving back to my listeners who need to hear, who might not understand where my life experience is, you know? So they can yeah. kind of uh, kind of get a, not, not, it might not understand it fully, but get a snapshot of what JR deals with when he's off the radio. Now, I say from myself, I'm not the, at the arena covering the game. It's, I yeah. go back to being JR, young black male in Atlanta, not just JR the radio host. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, I think, you know, that, that was where I think one of the, the things that came forward this summer is I think people begin to listen. You know, people who may come from a different demographic and, and a different socioeconomic situation, people said, you know what, um, man, we never understood that. And, and you know, I, I grew up in inner city Houston. And so, you, you know, basketball is kind of the sport of the poor in America. Uh, in Europe and in Africa, it, it's soccer. Um, in basketball or in America, it's basketball. I, I didn't have the money to afford a helmet and cleats. Uh, I couldn't afford a baseball bat and a glove, uh, but I could run down to the end of the street and play with 12, 15 other kids and, with one ball. And, and, and so, you know, you were aware of some of the socioeconomic issues that were occurring. I don't know that a lot of people are. And so just to have the opportunity to listen um, during the course of this summer, George Floyd was from the same area I was. Um, he went to Yates High School um, there, there in Third Ward, uh, Houston. And so I probably was in a gym. We're around the same age uh, as him at the same time. And, and, and you just became so conscientious. And I think everybody was just sickened by that entire event. And I think what it allowed people to do was, one, vent, right? And, and people were allowed to share their frustration. But the second part was, 
people I, to some degree, um, I think when they were conscientious, began to just listen instead of debate. Hey, that's your experience. Like, man, you know what? You shouldn't feel that way about the, this situation or that situation if you ever find it in. And so I do think that what it brought about was a number of people um, who became empathetic uh, mm -hmm. and began to listen and, and, and understand better issues that may not necessarily be in their direct home, but became wider about some of the diverse things that people experience. And coach, the email responses I've gotten since June of people who say I, I had no idea, Jr. I mean, I, of course you would, because I wouldn't share it on the radio list. It was, yeah. I wouldn't just openly tell you that I grew up poor, you know, that I grew up on free lunch. I grew up on Medicaid and Medicare. I'm just gonna tell you that, just, you know, just, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. because, right? You know, so it, this is this moment allowed me to share with my listeners my my true life story and tell them that hey, yeah. I came from nothing. So getting a master's degree and having my own radio show platform and working around the NBA and NFL and MLB. I mean, I, I'm a great story on, on that it happened in this country. Yeah. So if unless this happened, I never would have shared my listeners my my true life story. And, and, and I think what it does is it obviously, you know, people are attracted to stories and, and people are attracted to uh, the whole idea of man listen to their situation, better understand them. And then you get a better idea about the, the, the empathy that, that we all need to have about everybody's situation. People at the end of the day want to feel valued and the way that you value people is you listen. And again, I thought that's what this summer allowed um, those who were sensitive to it to do. And Coach Lamar, yes, man, and as, as your young men grew from this, um, as you talked about it on Zoom, how was those Zoom calls, man, when your guys shared their experiences with you, with you did around the team and how was open forums? I feel like for me, Coach, the open forums I've had on Zooms with different teams this year and other co coaches had me to come speak was great because seeing guys be open and, and being vulnerable to share because a lot of times guys are kind of tight and they don't want to really share. They want to be macho. But seeing guys really let their let the guard down and say, this is, this is who I am was really, really for me, really refreshing, Coach. Yeah, I mean, and we had a number of them. You know, as as, as I mentioned to our, our players, if all we're doing is talking about a twelve ounce rubber ball, uh, we're failing you guys. Uh, the, I mean, a twelve ounce rubber ball isn't doing much for your life. And so, it, it we had a number of guys. I thought one of the, of the guys who did a phenomenal job and provided a great perspective was Clark Kellogg with CBS Sports. Clark was a really good basketball player, but his, his dad and his granddad were in the middle of, of riots that he remembers vividly because they were in um, the police unit. And, and he could talk about the experience that they had just as black officers and going through that through the summer. And then also the platform that the media presents. And, and so just, hey, how do you navigate this, this world of, man, I have something to say but maybe I'm too young. I have something to say, but people don't listen to me because I only average two points a game. And to, to just kind of share with them that, you know what, your voice is important and we all have a role to play here and you need to understand that you're supported on this end. And, and so I think that was the biggest thing that we tried to get across to our guys is one, you're supported and two, we all have a role to play. And, and there's a way to go about this uh, the right way. And we wanted to invest in our, in our guys with a number of people visiting with them um, from, the, from, from a, a perspective of where it was historical and they could learn. And, and hopefully they benefited from it. And coach, you know, what's so amazing about this is as a coach that, you know, these young men are getting prepared for life because, you know, you, you're in your 40s, I'm in my 30s, they're in their early 20s. Life's going to hit you with a curveball or, or a fastball where you don't see it coming. And they got a life 101 experience in, kind of, in, in a, a big way about how life is, you know, how you think it's all good and, oh, yeah, and boom, life hits you. So 2020, you taught your young men, a lot of young men in college basketball, a lesson for the rest of their lives going forward. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mean, the more that you can invest in your players about things that are going to translate well beyond the game, you know, um, you, you just, you, your willingness to serve others. You know, the only way you're going to be able to serve others is if they trust you. Uh, well, you know what? How do you earn people's trust? 
um, you have to give great effort. Uh, you have to give, have great resiliency. You have to have the right attitude, right? Uh, if you have a bad attitude, people will duck off in bathrooms to hide from yes. being around you. But if you have the right attitude and a good attitude, people will flock to you. And, and so I think all of these things that allow for teams to be good basketball teams, these intangibles, you see them play out in, in, in their everyday life, in their everyday world. And, and we're constantly trying to reinforce those things. One, we're trying to model them. And then two, we're trying to make sure that we, uh, that we reinforce them. But you do realize you don't now, but you will as you get older, the value. You know, as I share with our guys, if, uh, if you're going to quit on that play and you're not going to fight for your teammates, how do I know that you're not going to one day quit on your wife? How do I know that you're not one day going to quit on your children? Uh, and so I'm not going to let you quit on a play because there's much bigger things that we don't need to quit on. So let's make sure we give great attention to the smallest details in order that we don't let this mentality seep into us. Now, Coach, speaking of details, how was it to kind of prepare for the season? Uh, you know, putting stuff in, ramp, ramp, ramping guys up to prevent that injury at nags all year long because, you know, I can only imagine trying to put it in offense and defense when you can't be everybody on the court at the same time trying to get guys the workouts without getting them sick as well. So how was that process trying to put in, install and get guys ramped up to play the way you all played 10 games so far? Yeah, I mean, one, we, we, we were able to start practice a little bit earlier than normal, so that helped. And then, you know, we, we had two starters returning, one in Max A. Smith, the other in Kevin O'Banner. Both of them are top 25 in the country in scoring right now. And so we're, we're the only team in the country to have two guys, um, to uh, multiple guys in top 25 in scoring. So they were the two returners. So they were kind of our experienced guys. But trying to get the other guys, even though we had returning Letterman, uh, acclimated, it's new, right? Um, some guys may not be familiar with the terminology. And then you have the COVID interruptions, right? Um, back, back in August and September, it was if somebody got COVID, you were done for two weeks. So I can remember we'd practice a day, uh, done for two weeks, practice another day, done for two weeks. And so, I mean, you, there were just all of these interruptions. So we tried to utilize as much film as possible. We tried to utilize as much individuals as possible uh, since we couldn't be together as a team. And, you know, give a, a, a huge credit to the strength staff here at ORU. Um, Ashton Mirpool did a phenomenal job. And then our coaching staff, um, Sam Patterson, Solomon Bozeman, Russell Springman, did phenomenal work in just helping our guys. And, and then we tried to get together via Zoom and film and, and talk through these. But it, it, it's, it's not easy. But the truth is, is we weren't the only ones doing it. Everybody was in this boat. Most definitely, Coach. And I'm going to ask you about somebody you mean you know good well, Matt Driscoll. Uh, tell us about Coach Matt Driscoll, man. He's a good buddy of mine as well, a, a guy from Baylor as well, that, that tree. So tell us about your time with him, man. Yeah, I love that guy. Uh, Matt, Matt Driscoll, obviously he's the all-time winningest coach at, at the University of North Florida. And you talk about a guy who you're attracted to because of his attitude. That's him. Um, I, in, in all honesty, our first few years at Baylor, we weren't very good. And we, we would go until about two, three o'clock in the morning. We'd, we'd work and be in the office and go and we'd be back in by 8 a.m. And, and that wasn't like a six day a week thing. That, that was an everyday deal. And we did that for pretty much our first four years, um, 3 a.m. And then everybody was back at eight. Coach Drew didn't make us do that. But Matt Driscoll was the guy everybody was trying to beat. He was an energizer bunny. I was, yes, you know, I was younger, and I'm like, man, I'm going to stay longer than Coach Driscoll. I'm going to get here earlier, than, and I couldn't do it as much as I wanted to. And just, you know, the competitiveness in you comes out, and you're like, I'm going to outwork that guy. And you're like, okay, you know what? He's just built different. Uh, I cannot outwork that guy. Now, he runs on about 900 cups of Dunkin' Donuts yes. uh, every <laughs> single day. And so he, he has some fuel that the rest of us don't necessarily have. But who he is as a man, who he is as a dad, his son, Chase Driscoll, was a GA for us uh, last year. And he's an assistant coach now in Florida. And uh, Paxton Driscoll, they used to babysit my children uh, when my kids were young, he and his wife, Carrie. But you just talk about phenomenal people. 
Uh, that's who Coach Driscoll is. And those kids at UNF are so fortunate uh, to have a man like that pour into them and invest. I know he just got uh, his his uh, best player back, uh, from what I understand. And, and, and so he'll, he'll do phenomenal work as they fight for an Atlantic Sun um, uh, first place trophy this year. Yeah, he's a favorite of mine. Talks on the show, man. He's always energetic, man. I just, I, 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 I say, hey, coach, you, it's your show, man. Yeah, do, that, do, that's a, that's a different level of energy. Do your and, thing. <laughs> and he's always been that way. He has not changed. Hey, coach, I thought I had energy, but hey, when he called on the show, he has more than I do. I'm like, okay, yeah. hey, coach, <laughs> I can't beat you, man. You got all yeah. energy in the world, man. And I'm in 30, 33. Ask him, yeah, ask him one question, and then you don't really have to do any more of your show. Because uh, he'll take <laughs> he'll take off. Hey, I, I last I had him on the show the other week. Four questions. And it was all. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that. You got forty five minutes worth of material right there. Even better, fifty fifty four minutes actually. <laughs> Even better than that, fifty four <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Hey, he, I said, I said, Coach Driscoll, you lucky that I, have, I, I own my show. I don't have, have no hard outs because if I had a hard out, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely have to splice it. Yeah, yes, indeed. Well, Coach Bill, thank you for your time today as always. Let's love, love to you and your staff and your players. Be healthy and be safe. We'll talk to you real soon now. Boss, man, thanks for all you do, brother. Inside, Coach, be good now. Bye-bye.